since we've established this idea that there are these different views of presidential power, right? And that different presidents behave differently. So that some presidents are like willing to do whatever is necessary, but maybe the doing whatever is necessary is a result of their time period. Whereas we have other presidents who have been kind of like very bound and they'll only do explicitly what they want to do, but then that's probably going to affect their, their, our perception of them in history. So we have two categories of presidential power. We have formal powers. That means you can open up to Article 2, Section 2, and you can find them. Like the framers gave the president those powers. Okay? We can refer to those as formal powers. We can call them express powers. We can call them like framers' intent, all of those things. So let's kind of work through those first to make sure that you understand what those are. So we just want to make a list. You've got a place there in your paper just to list it there in the box. So the first one is where we, we always say that the executive branch enforces the law. Well, that's where we get this. It says in the very beginning of Article 2, Section 2, it says that the president should take care that the law is faithfully executed. One of the defects we had under the Articles of Confederation is that our legislature could make laws, but then we didn't have anybody to enforce it. Well, then obviously it's not really worth anything. So it's his job to make sure that somehow, some way, that law gets fulfilled and gets carried out. The Constitution also made the president in charge of the military. Uh, we can refer to that as being commander in chief. Mm -hmm. um, but it means that the president ultimately decides troop movement. They decide where to get involved militarily, how to get involved, will we get involved, will we not get involved. Modern day, do we drop a bomb, do we not drop a bomb, do we um, engage in like this new kind of warfare where it's not so much just like hand-to-hand -hand combat, etc. That is all the job of our president, and in my the most powerful tools that a modern president has. Because at the end of the day, like that, that decision lies solely in the hands of our president. And you know, if you think about the drama of TV shows or like movies where you see that, where everybody's sitting around in the Situation Room, and you've got the National Security Council. Is that real? Is yeah, oh, absolutely. And they're all like advising the president and saying, Mr. President, you should do this, and you've got the Joint Chiefs of Staff and you've got the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and the Director of the CIA and all these people are saying all these things and then ultimately the President has to make that decision. Why would it be important, do you think, to our framers to make that person be a civilian and not put the military in charge of the military itself? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, so okay. Like, yeah, we're going to do this. Yeah, we're going to take this. And they wouldn't yeah. always think about it. Like, military just can't think of like, any military standpoint. Yeah. They're, they're not going to think about the whole country. They think of like, how can I impact like, everybody else? Awesome. That doesn't mean that the person can't have had military experience. It just means that while president, they have to, they can't be in the military. Okay? All right. Our next power. Can president can negotiate treaties. Tell me what a treaty is, David Hobson. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Wait, but don't, oh, never mind. I was going to say, don't Congress have to check that, but they don't. Look, if, yes, they do Wait. check that. What part of Congress checks that? The, shoot. These are me really nervous. It is oh, the, the, the yes, very, very good. Okay, so we set it up so that if we're going to have an agreement made with a foreign nation, while Congress has a lot of powers, it's kind of hard for Congress to negotiate a treaty. Well, didn't, with the whole thing with Germany, the treaty of Versailles, didn't they not even like, agree with it, but it still happened? Um, that's why I said no. Well, that's different. We're going to get onto that and just, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But let me, okay, let's give you an example, though, of that. Uh, remember um, President Wilson, and you guys remember he negotiated the League of Nations? Mm -hmm. Like, that was his baby, right? Like, he goes around, he's working really hard. Good, very good. Yeah. Um, but then the Senate refused to approve it, right? Yeah. So that is a, there's a good example of how our system is different because you have the leaders of other nations, their executives can negotiate the treaty, and in most of those places it just becomes law. Like it's, that's what it is. But in our situation, our president can negotiate it, but because of how we separated power, then he's still subject to some kind of check. Well, we're going to talk about modern presidents have ways around that, okay? <laughs> All right, we know that the president must can veto a bill or sign a bill. So he can potentially be the last stop on a piece of legislation. 
Yes, presidents can have their veto overridden, but that's fairly difficult. I mean, that takes a lot of people to override a veto. And if you guys remember, I had you look at that chart, and you remember there were some pretty big dis distinctions where mm -hmm. some presidents had had quite a few and others, like, you know, not successful with that at all. The president also, the Constitution says that the president can call Congress into special session. Um, that's a little bit outdated. What that would mean is like that if Congress had gone into recess, they had gone into some kind of holiday and they were all home, he could make them come back to Washington to deal with some particular problem. So because of travel, because of like the fact that they pretty much work all the time now anyway, that's not super important, but it does tell you about the framers' intent. It does say that back then, when they weren't going to be this full-time body working in Washington, D.C. all the time, if the president needed Congress's approval for something, maybe he needed a declaration of war. Maybe he needed funding right. for something. Well, yeah, but, but remember, back then, in 1787, they weren't, they weren't there all the time. You know, whereas now, they work pretty much year-round. All right, the next one. Deliver the State of the Union. In Article 2, Section 2, it says that the president must advise Congress on the State of the Union. So he's supposed to tell Congress what his perspective is on the country. Starting with Jefferson, he delivered a letter. Um, President Wilson was the first one that actually went to Congress and to both chambers of Congress he gave a speech. But the advent of television is really different because now you have both chambers of Congress, you have the Supreme Court sitting there, you have all but one member of the cabinet, we'll talk about why that person's not there, um, and then you've got like all these guests and it's a televised speech. But at the end of the day, it is still the president's yearly opportunity to tell Congress, this is what I want you to do. This is the executive view of, the of what's going on in our country, and these are the kind of laws I want you to make. The president has the ability to welcome ambassadors to our country <coughs> that come from other countries. So we call that receiving ambassadors. He also has the ability to appoint people. So if we want to have... Um, like we've just opened up now diplomatic um, recognition of Cuba, so we'll have an ambassador go to Cuba. And so it will be President Obama's uh, decision for like who that person's going to be to go and reside in Cuba and live at the embassy and be like our American representative there. But remember, who has to approve that? <laughs> what part of the Congress? No, the Senate. The Senate. Okay, but isn't that, isn't that like if you get like stuck in in a different country, but you're American, you have to go yeah. there and yeah. you have to prove that you're American. Mm -hmm. How yeah. would you do that if you didn't have like anything, like a passport? Like if you lost your passport, you know. I've never had to do that, so I don't really know. On TV, they <laughs> they, they look in this big database and look for your thumbprints, and I don't know, I don't know. Okay, the next one is one we don't talk about a lot, but I think it could it could actually have huge ramifications. The power of recognition. Um, there, there's turmoil all over the world. There's changes, um, nations split, there's civil war, there's all kinds of stuff. It is the American president's responsibility to decide if you're going to recognize another nation as a legitimate nation. So the example I always like to think about is President Nixon went to China. Actually, did you guys study that in U.S. history? Yeah, I think it's because of the Oh, it's like such oh, a big deal. So, oh, yeah, we did. We did. Do you want to tell us the story? Do you remember? No, I want you to tell it. No. I don't remember everything. Okay. Okay, well, anyway, um, so China had um, previously been in charge, like the nationalists were the, was the party that was in charge of China, and then Mao Zedong, you guys remember learning about him in the history, and he, huh? Um, no. Speaking about a picture? Yeah. Okay, I'm getting there. So Mao Zedong was a communist, right, yeah. and there was fighting, and the country split, and that's when it became, the, uh, like China became communist China. So we have no relationship with them because we don't like communism, right? And so President Nixon is the first president, American president, that went to China. Remember, like we, like you learned about his uh, like foreign policy and all of that kind of stuff. And the idea was we're going to open up diplomatic relationships with them. It doesn't mean that we're advocating communism, but it says we're going to recognize that you are a legit nation. Like you have a right to exist. You're not just some crazy rogue cult-like kind of thing, but you actually belong and you have a right to be there. 
Can you imagine if that didn't happen? Like, how, it is a major turning point in U.S. history. They wrote an opera called Nixon in China. Like, it's that big a deal. And I've talked to people before that say that there's, like, pictures still, like, in China of, like, um, like all over the place, pictures of Mao and President Nixon, because it's, like, the symbol of this forging of two, like, major powers in the world, where it's not so much that they're forged together, but they're going to recognize. So that can happen anywhere. So like anytime if you think about like all the movement of Eastern Europe, like after the Cold War fell, and like all these different nations, it would be the job of the sitting president to decide, yeah, you're a legit nation, no, you're not, you're still under their control. And that can really like forge, like determine history. All right. Our president has clemency powers. This is the one you probably have discussed the least in US history, because it's not so much like newsworthy. I mean, it's newsworthy, but it's more like specific. Oh, like, um, Ford. Uh-huh. Good. Miss Decker would be so proud. I know. Yeah. She's never here. Well, because <laughs> she has class. But, <laughs> okay, so let me kind of walk you through these. Clemency powers is, um, these are the president's judicial powers. So the president has the ability through, like, basically through the enforcer of law, to sometimes check the judiciary and, and um, change like a decision that the court has made. So the president can pardon someone. If someone has been convicted of a federal crime, the president can pardon them, which is like a get out of jail free card. They can say there were extenuating circumstances and for whatever reason, we're gonna allow this person to get out now, okay? Um, it could also say that we're not gonna allow this person to be prosecuted. So go back to the Ford example. Who did Ford pardon? Uh. Oh. Nixon. Nixon. All right. He now that pardon did not relate to the potential impeachment because Nixon had already resigned. Yeah. But Nixon had done so many things that he potentially could have been criminally charged. Ford said, "We just want to move on as a nation, so we're going to pardon him so that there can be no criminal charges against him, and then we're going to kind of unify." Obviously, that hurt Ford yeah, in the long run. Lot, yeah, yeah, for sure. The president also has the ability to grant a reprieve. A reprieve would be that it's like some kind of like um, forgiveness for your sentence, so maybe we're going to shorten it. Back in the 80s, we had a bunch of laws that were put in place. Um, there were these like mandatory minimum sentences where if you commit were um, somehow associated with a drug crime, then you would have to get like this kind of sentence. Well, we have had quite a few reprieves granted there where say somebody was involved in like um, like nonviolent, like marijuana kind of possession or selling or whatever, and it's three times and they end up in jail for 10 years. So reprieves might be given in that way. I mean, I get that would be an example. Okay. okay. Amnesty is legal forgiveness to a large group of people. So you've got a group of people who have committed a crime, and it's like a blanket pardon for all of them. So um, what did a lot of people do during Vietnam that was illegal? Well, probably a lot of things, but like specifically um, in relationship to the military. Okay, what about the war? What did a lot of people not do? I can't hear you, Tanner. Right, but I mean, like people, like like what did a lot of people do in relationship to the military? They approach, yeah. But what did you say? Good, okay, so we had a draft that was enacted, right? Yeah, so if you get drafted, you have, you have to go. Like, that's yeah. law. Like, you have to go serve in the military. Right. right, but a lot of people didn't. They just, like, abdicated. They went to Canada, they went to Europe, they went wherever, and they just left the country. So I think it was Carter. It could have been Ford. I'm not sure if it was Ford or Carter. One of them issued amnesty, and they said, if you were a draft dodger during Vietnam, we're going to grant you forgiveness. Just come back to America. It was a bad time. We're not going to prosecute you. Um, you hear that word amnesty used a lot in relationship to illegal immigrants to say, let's just kind of like wipe the slate clean, and then we'll move forward. Do they get sent back? Or just like, when you say like wipe the slate clean, like, do you get sent back? Or they no. stay here? Say, we're not going to prosecute you. Let's go through a process. Let's